Hey everybody, I'm back again to give my thoughts on the, I think, highly controversial uh, latest film from Christopher Nolan entitled Tenet. Um, I know a lot of you guys watched it, particularly it seemed like a lot of people watched it over the Christmas holiday. Uh, makes sense. I mean, you know, you're home, you're not at work, you're with family. Let's watch something, let's turn on something, watch it as a family. I know we do that a lot in my family, you know, get together on holidays and watch films. And um, something that I love, I watched uh, Tenet, Soul and something else I believe over the Christmas holidays. The reason I'm just getting the Tenant video out is because one, I wanted to watch it again, which I've done. And I also wanted to kind of organize my thoughts around it, um, <laughs> considering that organization isn't one of Tenant's strong points, but um, I, I really wanted to wrap my head around it and get my thoughts in order, uh, mainly for two reasons. One, you know, if I'm going to put out a video, you know, I don't want to sound like a complete jackass. I want to sound like I at least have some kind of idea of what I'm talking about. But also, I know that there's been a lot of uh, confusion regarding Tenet. Um, a lot of people have just like, I don't know what the fuck's going on in this movie. And I wanted to try to bring some form of clarity to that. But then I also wanted to point out that your inability to follow Tenet is not your fault. Um, and most of the time it is, <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest. A lot of times when I see people go, I don't understand this movie. This doesn't make sense. This is confusing. Um, it's usually because they probably just weren't paying close enough attention. Or, you know, it's just, it just might not be something that is for them, which is fine. Um, in this case, though, I think uh, a viewer's inability or, or even just difficulty in following the plot of Tenet is not their fault. It is the fault of, of, of the film. So, uh, but I don't want to shit on it because it is not a shitty film by any means. Um, I actually think that Tenet has, uh, Tenet's like a, a, a fix or two away from being absolutely phenomenal. Like I'm talking like all time great levels of awesomeness. It's, it's just where Tenet fails, it fails so spectacularly that you can't even really I don't want to say you can't save it because it's, in my opinion, it is still worth watching. I do still think it is, in a large sense, a very good film. It's just, it, it, it's, it's handful of, I can't even say handful. It really kind of only makes one mistake. But it's such a big one, and it's one that persists throughout the entire film, that it kind of does make it unwatchable at times. And I can definitely see, and, and, and the point, I'm, I'm gonna divert a little bit here. The whole point of this channel and these videos is to use my, uh, I don't wanna say knowledge or, or even expertise, but just like the fact that as an avid fan of film and television, I've been watching it for a long time. I went to college as a film major. And, and my goal here is to give you guys an idea of whether or not something is worth watching. So whether or not it's something that I think is great, um, sometimes, and I've said this on the show, uh, sometimes it, might, it just might not be for you. Like Raised by Wolves is something that I really enjoy that it's difficult for me to recommend to uh, your average viewer because it's such hardcore sci-fi that I feel like a lot of people would enjoy it. And my goal here is to give you guys uh, my opinion on a, te a television show, a film, a sporting event, whatever, and to give you an idea of whether or not you want to watch it. And despite the fact that Tenet does like, well, I'm just throwing numbers out here, we'll say nine out of 10 things right. The one thing it does wrong, it does so wrong that I, ca I, I can't really s sit here and say, you should watch this because I feel like nine out of 10 people are gonna watch it and go, I don't know what the fuck's going on here. And that's not their fault. But um, I'm just going to get into talking about the film a little bit. Um, I want to start by talking about the fact that um, this film hits very high marks in a lot of ways. Um, visually, it looks amazing. It would have been stunning to watch in IMAX. And we're not talking like amazing, like watching a Marvel film where the special effects are insane. I'm talking about like these locations that are in this film are insane. Beautiful places overseas that I, I've never been to and likely never will be. Um, all kinds of uh, just amazing. I'm, I'm sure there's probably some sets in here as well. I, I, I don't really know how. Um, I haven't done a, 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 a ton of research uh, uh, on like background information on the film. I do that sometimes because uh, sometimes I feel like it matters. Like, for instance, one of the other things this film is great with is the score. 
Um, it sounds like like they like Christopher Nolan films always do this. They have like great tension. The the music helps elevate the tension where it already exists in the film. So you have like uh, for instance the opening scene of this film is uh, I guess a we'll just call it a mission. A mission takes place within an opera at the start of the film. And the score during this, I guess we'll call it a heist. The score during this heist is amazing and it helps build the tension. Think uh, at the beginning of The Dark Knight with the bank robbery. Um, like that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and I found out that the score was done by Ludwig Göransson, which is the uh, brilliant uh, genius who did the uh, score of the theme uh, for The Mandalorian, which is my number one favorite theme currently and now of all time. So, um that explains why the score is so great. Um, but yeah, going back to the locations briefly, it's just amazing to look at. Um, you could tell it's shot, and Christopher Nolan, you know, he, he makes a big deal out of this, like what kind of cameras he uses to film his, his, his movies, his projects. You could tell the finest equipment was used, the finest locations used. It just looks breathtaking. Um, the acting is phenomenal as well. Um, John David Washington is great as the protagonist of the film, <laughs> as the protagonist and as the protagonist of the film. Um, that was a slight joke. Uh, the, he does not have a name in the film. He just goes by the protagonist. Even if you look at the credits, it just says the protagonist. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, this is actually one of the things that I liked the most about Tenet was the fact that John David Washington, obviously black man, right? He's pretending to be someone who uh, is of the proper status to be rubbing elbows with um, rich white billionaires overseas, you know, on yachts and shit like that. And you would think that the people who run in those circles generally aren't accustomed to seeing a black man there. And they treat him as such. It seems like any time John David Washington's character, I'm just going to call him the protagonist, any time the protagonist enters a new scene with new people, it seems like he's always disrespected to some sort of degree. And what I liked about it was that he didn't even, he never got offended. He never uh, uh, snapped at anybody, but his responses to the disrespect were always equally, if not more so dismissive of the person offering that disrespect. So it's like, give an example, one of my favorite scenes in the film, um, he meets with uh, Michael Caine, as you do in all all Christopher Nolan films. There has to be at least a scene with Michael Caine. Um, he meets with Michael Caine, and as he's arriving at the table, the waiter comes up, and uh, he said, uh, the protagonist says, I'll have what, what he's having, pointing to to Michael Caine. And he says, I'll send the waiter over. And he says, no bother, just pat don't bother, just pass on the order. And then he's leaving, and... The guy, they have a conversation that's maybe like five to 10 minutes. So well before uh, you would see any food at a restaurant and he goes to leave. The guy brings the, the guy, the guy's bringing out the food as he's leaving and he has the nerve to go, can you box that up for me? The guy goes, absolutely not. But um, he, that kind of stuff happens a lot where it kind of feels like people are treating him as if he doesn't belong. And then he shows that not only does he belong, but you don't belong because you're not on his level as far as like uh, interacting in these circles. And most most importantly, if you're a fucking tough guy, you're in trouble because he's going to kick your ass with a cheese grater. So there's all kinds of cool shit with that. And I think uh, the protagonist does a great job of, of showing, a, like, kind of like taking the race out of it, even though he's the only black guy in the movie. It's almost like he 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 very, very... I don't want to say subtly. It's, it's it's a very, like, a sharp kind of, like, every time you speak to someone who disrespects him, it's kind of like, I see what you did there. I'm going to disrespect you a little bit more so you can fall in the line. And I, I like that cockiness and that arrogance of him throughout the film. I thought that was great stuff. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I kind of wanted to find some balance in discussing the score versus the sound. Um, the music, the score, like to the scenes of the action scenes is great, but the sound at times is wonky. Like it's, I watch things with the captions on all the time, all the time. Cause I don't ever want to miss dialogue. Um, the only time I turn off captions is if I'm watching uh, a comedy and when I, it, because I don't want to see the joke before they say it. So, and when I say a comedy, I mean, stand up comedy, not like I'll watch a, a scripted sitcom with 
with the captions on because again i don't want to miss the dialogue but um i run that risk with like live comedy like Sat well, saturday night live's not really gonna give you captions that are gonna spoil things but like stand-up comedy stuff like that uh i turn the captions off for that because i don't want the joke to be spoiled but i watch with the captions on there were times with this film where if i didn't have the captions on i wouldn't have heard what was said and that's a problem um i think it's indicative of a larger problem that i'm feel like I'm starting to see with Christopher Nolan films is that he wants to do and achieve so much. And I think his goal of creating something new or something uh, that challenges you uh, has superseded the, go the what should be the goal of just putting out a great film. And the one place where Tenet struggles mightily is with the editing. Um, and the reason I say this is because now that I've watched it twice and I had this thought after watching it the first time, but it was just validated watching it another time is that, uh, the, the concept of the film is difficult to follow. We're talking about, uh, basically it's about, uh, being able to reverse the entropy of, of objects or people so that they go, they, they, they flow through time and in the inverse direction. So like we're, we're going through, we're going th forward through time. Um, and technology has been created that reverses the ent entropy of objects or people that allows them to go backwards through time. And uh, essentially, this is going to be used for some world ending apocalypse. It's not really important, you know, um, it, it, the details and how they get there, but just know it's meant to be used to essentially end the world. Um, the way that plays out throughout the film with, 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 uh, timey wimey kind of shit where you have like like they literally have someone who uh is going forward through time enters a machine and now they're coming out of the machine and now they're going backwards through time so now they're watching themselves come out of this machine doing what they you know and now going through what they've already witnessed in a different direction and like that kind of concept of like people flowing through time differently and crossing paths is going to be hard to follow it's going to be confusing because our brains just aren't wired that way. I get that. But I don't think that's why people were confused by this film. People were confused by this film because it goes all over the fucking place with no explanation whatsoever. You cut from one scene to the next. Where is he? Where is he at? Who is this person? Why is he here? Like, there's, there's so many times throughout this film where you find out vital information way the fuck past when you should be finding it out. Like, oops, <laughs> watching that was knocked over my water. <laughs> um, and I think the best example of this is that if you are watching this video, you might have had the thought, why would somebody want to end the entire world? Does that not include you? Like, why would you want to end the entire world? The motivation behind this entire sinister plot is not revealed until I think within the final 10 minutes of the film in like one or two lines of throwaway dialogue. It, it, essentially, it's for climate change. We killed the planet. Um, this caused, uh, you know, the hole in the ozone layer, caused the waters to flood and to empty out the oceans. And, uh, and, and we fucked up the planet. So the people in the future are willing to fuck us up to stop that from happening and just kind of go hands off on the paradox of, uh, well, they refer to it as the grandfather paradox within the film, which is the idea that if you go back in time to kill your grandfather, how's that possible? Because if you successfully kill your grandfather, then you weren't born to go back in time to kill him. So that paradox exists within this film. And the individuals who are uh, interested in ending the world in our current day are kind of like hands off on the grandfather paradox. Like we are willing to accept the risk of uh, ending the world back then, ending us right now. Um, and is something in my beard? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna do that. Yeah, there was. Uh, I'm glad I saw that. Um, that concept can be difficult to follow uh, and they don't explain the why until the very end. So I'm sitting there in the film the whole time like, why is anyone doing this? Like, why is anyone doing any of these things? And um, you don't find that out until the end. And, and what I just explained was more explanation than they gave. It was up, like it was literally like a sentence or two. Like the oceans flooded and because you guys fucked it up. <laughs> so it was like literally, it's kind of like that simple how they explained it. But um, the film goes 
from uh, location to location, um, plot point to plot point. And I never, even watching it the second time with the knowledge of what is going to happen, I still sit there and go, why, where is he right now? And, and, and not how did he get in here, but what was told to him to tell, to motivate him to go to this next place? So like, say for instance, if you're in a, if you're watching a spy film, right? And they're like, we need to attain blank. Uh, it, you will usually hear or see this in some form of dialogue. Like, hey, you know, they, they spell that kind of shit out. Hey, uh, we need to get this object to stop the end of the world. If you want to uh, find this object, you need to talk to so-and-so. And that's how it happens. Now, imagine that same scenario without the, if you want to stop the world, you need to talk to so-and-so. Imagine just your character is now in a place. And you don't know why. You don't know who he's meant to see. You don't know wh how he was even how he even knew to go to that place. So, like, imagine the film through the entire film. Like, a lot of shit is explained at the end, where it's like you go back and you're like, okay, well, that thing that was confusing before makes sense. But when you spend up to that point two hours, where every scene is, you kind of gotta get your bearings. Like, okay, where are we? What's going on? And then you find it out as the scene or the film progresses and then you go to the next scene and you're right back like where are we again why is he here how did he who told him to go here like what that is why the movie is confusing to people because there are so many times where you don't know what the fuck's going on not because the plot is confusing but because the the structure of the film is so incredibly convoluted unnecessarily it doesn't need to be this is a film that could have played played out in a more straightforward fashion and had that been done instead of Christopher Nolan, I, like I envision Christopher Nolan, I don't envision it, but like I, <laughs> I, I imagine Christopher Nolan like jerking off to making like an incredibly confusing movie. Like the more, the less sense it makes, the more convoluted it is, the more aroused he gets. Like that's, that's how convoluted this film is in its structure and how it plays out. The concepts, uh, just the ideas of like the backwards technology, the inversion, all that kind of shit. It's basically really just a spy film with like, uh, we need to get something to stop the end of the world, your basic basic plot. And a, a wrinkle in this is that you can run across motherfuckers or objects that can travel backwards through time. That's not that complicated. But when you intentionally, when you intentionally create the scenes and splice them together in a way that's meant to keep the viewer confused, that's different than challenging somebody. That's just mind fucking people. And I think that was done to such a high degree with Tenet that it hurt the film in an irreparable way. Like it's really, really hard for me to recommend this to someone when I know 90% of people are gonna be like, what the fuck's going on? And even for me watching it the first time, I was like, I know what's going on, but this is so convoluted and it makes so little sense because of the way each scene is structured and how it flows. So, um, Tenet's a tough one to recommend. Like, I like a lot about this film on a really high level. Like, again, if this plays out in not even in a straightforward fashion, but just in, in something that's a little bit less convoluted, like I said, you get a, you get a, a throwaway line or two, uh, go find so-and-so in blank. And that's it. Now I know. Okay, now I see I see the protagonist again. He's in blank looking for so and so. That does happen, but it doesn't happen enough at all. Like it needs to it happens maybe like twice. Whereas it needs to happen like 10 times. <laughs> so um it's a tough one to recommend. Uh there's a lot of things that I love about it. Um it's something that I found it significantly more rewarding on a second watch. I'd probably find it even more rewarding on a third. Um, but um, it's just, again, it's just something that it's just so difficult to follow just because just of the way the film progresses and the way it's edited together. It's, it's so, it's so difficult to follow. Um, even when you know what's going to happen, that's the problem. The fact that I watched it a second time, knowing how it plays out and still sitting here like, yes, but this is wrong. He should not like, I don't know where he is right now because of the, the film telling me in a proper way. I know where he is right now because I've already seen this. <laughs> so I see how it plays out over time. Like, I don't like that. I don't like, I don't like to be confused for the sake of confusion. 
it needs to serve a purpose and it doesn't here like the the, the film does not need this inception was in, the, the the concept of inception revolved around a a a difficult to follow concept this doesn't it has a slightly difficult to follow concept but it is made way more difficult to follow for no reason and because of all the other aspects i've already covered about it that are great that just makes it makes it hurt that much more that i'm sitting here through this film which i would absolutely like this would have been the film of the year had it not been structured in this manner in such a convoluted manner and there's so many um directors showrunners who are getting these inexplicable hard-ons for making shit incredibly fucking confusing for no reason see westworld for the perfect example westworld season one phenomenal westworld season two was christopher nolan and uh his brother they, they make this the same. <laughs> that it all makes sense now it's the same fucking family. They're jerking each other off to how who can make the more confusing product. Okay, that's it. I can end the video there. I solved it. Jonah Nolan, Christopher Nolan jerking each other off to see who can make the more confusing product. That's it. Peace.